We are in a season where some of us, we may be struggling to find hope. Some of us may be struggling to find the strength to be able to push forward, but it is in this season, especially in this season, where you and I, where we should be looking to the Lord and where we should be seeking his comfort, we should be seeking his love. Hello there. Thanks for joining me for another Sunday school lesson this week. Our Sunday school lesson is the first lesson in the winter quarter, a winter quarter, which is titled, by the way, love in action. Love is a verb, not just a word you say. Love is about comforting. It is about uplifting. And, and that's what we're going to be seeing here in our Sunday school lesson this week and again throughout this quarter, where here in our Sunday school lesson this week, it is going to be taking a look at the prophecy from Isaiah. Let's understand something about we, before we even jump into our Sunday school lesson this week about the prophecy of Isaiah. The prophecy, especially that we're going to be taking a look at here in our Sunday school lesson this week, it happened well before those who would be living during what we were going to be discussing here in our Sunday school lesson this week. And then again, we're also going to be taking a look at one who is going to be coming. And so the prophecy of Isaiah happened well before he came into the world as well. So that's certainly something to keep in mind as again, in our Sunday school lesson today, we're going to be taking a look at the beauty of God's love, his grace. And what we mean by his love and his grace, it is unmerited. It is undeserved. The Lord loves us because that is what is in his nature. God is love. God is faithful. And that is what we're going to see here in our Sunday school lesson today. So I hope that you join me here in our lesson this week. We're there in the 40th chapter of Isaiah in the first verse. Our lesson, it opens up today with the Lord saying, comfort. Yes, comfort my people. God speaking these words to Isaiah. And these are words that Isaiah is to share with the Lord's people talking about Israel, specifically here talking about the Southern kingdom, talking about Judah. We'll see there in the second verse where the Lord instructs Isaiah to share those words, not simply to his people, but even to Jerusalem, to the city, which is personified here as a her. Isaiah was to cry out to her, to cry out to Jerusalem, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Very interesting words here, because again, what warfare, what warfare? And then again, note there, iniquity is used. What is iniquity? Iniquity is wickedness. Iniquity is sin. Everything that stands in opposition against the Lord. So this warfare, is this a warfare that was between Jerusalem and Babylon? Well, that wasn't really a warfare. Babylon, they came in and they wiped out Jerusalem. There wasn't really a challenge from the Southern kingdom of, of Judah. So again, it couldn't be that warfare. And certainly if you take a look at that verse there again, warfare and then iniquity is in mind. And then again, when you take a look at that verse there, God is saying that the warfare is over not the people, not Jerusalem. Jerusalem isn't saying that the warfare is over. God is saying the warfare is over. God is the one that was saying there that iniquity had been pardoned. So if you began to wonder, well, who, who is making this, this peace, if you will, is it the people? Because again, when there are two warring parties, typically the warring parties would come together and they would make that peace treaty. But here, the warfare is between Jerusalem and the Lord. In other words, the warfare was between the people of Jerusalem and the Lord. And so we would have to wonder, well, what would the people bring to the table to make peace with God? Would, would anybody be able to bring anything to the table to make peace with the Lord? Because once again, don't we live in iniquity today? Don't we live in sin today? what would we be able to bring to the table to ne negotiate with the Lord, to be able to make a treaty, to be able to make peace with God? There's nothing that you or I could bring to the table to make peace to God. There's nothing that we could offer to the Lord to make peace. And the same thing would happen or would go for those who were living in Jerusalem, the people that, that made up Jerusalem. The people, they wouldn't have had anything 
to be able to pardon their own iniquity. They wouldn't have had anything to be able to end the war that they had made with God because they chose to live sinfully, because they chose to ignore his prophets. They blatantly chose to live in the manner in which they live, but God is the one here who is saying the war is over with. God is the one who is saying here your iniquities are pardoned which would again speak to his love, which again would speak to his grace, which again, I want to point out to you as well. It shows that that God doesn't desire to destroy anybody. Yes, the Lord raised up the Babylonians. Yes, the Babylonians came in and they, they wiped out Jerusalem. They utterly left Jerusalem in, in desolation, but the people, they were carried away in exile. And again, from, from our previous lessons and from our knowledge, we know that the people lived in exile for, for 70 years when they then began to make a return to, to Jerusalem. Why did God allow that to happen? Why did God only set it for, for 70 years? Because again, many of us, we, we have this, this idea in mind that God is this ruthless tyrant that, that just wants to punish and punish and punish. But what we see here is that God does not desire to punish. God doesn't desire to destroy. God, we see here, is a merciful God to where, again, he was giving the people. He is going to give the people another chance. He's going to give the people another opportunity. That's what we see there in that second verse, where, again, the Lord said, hey, your warfare against me, I'm ending it. The people didn't have the, the ability to be able to end it. The Lord was saying there, your, war, your warfare, your iniquities, I'm going to pardon your iniquities. The people, they didn't have anything to be able to, to pardon their own iniquities with God. God was the one that was making for peace. I want you to always keep that in mind. God is the one who will make for peace. And so to make for peace, we see that in the third verse that Isaiah, he shared the prophecy of one crying in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Skipping to the fifth verse there, the prophecy continues saying, the one crying in the wilderness will cry out, the one whom the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it, the it being the glory that was revealed in this one. So who is being spoken of here? Well, the one who is being spoken of here is one who's going to bring comfort, one who is going to, to bring that pardon that was again promised to those who were of Judah. And we also know it's promised to the world as well. Again, when we take a look at that scripture there, the one crying out in the wilderness is something that we find over in John's, in John's gospel. When the religious leaders, when they came up to John the Baptist and they asked John who, he was, who it was that he was, John, he turned and he looked at them and John, he said that I'm the one, the voice that's crying in the wilderness. He is the forerunner, John the Baptist is. And who is it that he was the forerunner for? Well, John said that he was the forerunner for the Lord the Lord's Messiah, the one that would come into the world that will pardon not some sins, but will pardon all the sins of those who would turn and look to him and repent from their evil and wicked ways. John the Baptist was the forerunner for the Messiah that would bring peace to this world, the Messiah that would bring comfort to this world, the Messiah that would bring uplifting to all of those who once again look to him. Jesus said it himself, whosoever believes in me will not perish, but will what? Have everlasting life in the kingdom of his father, our Lord. So again, God, where the, the, those who are of Jerusalem, those who are of Judah may have been looking and going, ah, we can't make peace with the Lord. There's no way, there's nothing that we can do. When we ourselves today, when we think that God has it out for us, that we can't get on his good side, the Lord, he looks at us and he says, leave it to me. The Lord says to us, I will make peace. And again, he did that by giving the world his only begotten son. So when we skip down there to the 25th verse, 
we'll see there in the 25th verse that the Lord, he asks, to whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal? So who is there that is like God? I mean, in this scripture that we're looking at here today, you know, like I said, we see God's love. We, we see his grace. We see his mercy. Who is there that is like him? To where Jerusalem? And then again, all of us, the, the rest of the world, right? We make warfare against God every day. Every single day we make warfare against God. And again, how do we go about doing that? Well, we choose to live disobediently. And, and when I say we, I want you to understand here today, I'm not just talking about the sinner, but I'm talking about us justified sinners as well. Because again, none of us are perfect. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The only difference between the sinner and the justified sinner is we know that there is nobody that is like God. We know that God loves us regardless of, of who we are. We, we can be the biggest criminal in, in our society, right? Judged so harshly by man. But God will look on us and, and he will show us mercy. He will forgive us of our sins against him, of our crimes against him. We can be our own worst critic. We can be harder on ourselves than God is harder on us. Because many of us, we, especially all of us who are of faith, we feel that we have to be so perfect. And, and when we slip up, when we mess up, when we have that intrusive thought come across our mind, when we look at that woman the wrong way, or when we look at that man the wrong way, we, we can be so harsh on ourselves. And trust me, I understand it, but God can be so loving to us. God loves us more than we love ourselves. And there's nobody that is like him. Not only do we see God's love here, not only do we see his grace and his mercy here, but in this scripture here, we see his faithfulness as well. Because if you think about this, how would you treat somebody if they wrong you over and over and over and over again? How often are you going to give them a second chance? Some of us, if somebody wronged us, we are so quick to put them down and to turn away from them and get me, I get it. I understand it. We don't like when somebody mistreats and, and abuses us. We, we don't want to be taken advantage of. Again, trust me, I get it, I understand it. And, and a lot of times that's the most healthy thing for us to do is to turn away from those folks who are so toxic to us, right? But then again, look at how we treat the Lord. God has promised that he will never leave us, that he will never forsake us. And again, as we have seen in scripture before, every sin will be forgiven of us, except that unpardonable sin. We just saw that in our Sunday school lesson last week. That, that preaching and working against the spirit speaking against the Holy Spirit. That's the only sin that won't be pardoned. Jesus said, hey, you can speak against, you can speak against my name. And Jesus said, I will forgive you. I will show you mercy. Imagine that. Somebody speaking against your name, somebody lying on you. We'll be ready to fight. We'll be ready to go to war, won't we? We'll be so, so quick to put somebody down. But here God is where we will make warfare against him because ah, we couldn't live in obedience today. We couldn't live in obedience for 10 minutes. I, I think about, I think about my brother's dog sometime. He can't just sit still for, for five minutes. He has to get up, right? And that's how some of us can be. God can tell us to sit, wait, and we'll get up and we'll get out ahead of him. Again, making warfare against the Lord. But does God turn his back on us? He doesn't turn his back on us. God, he is faithful to us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. We will, we will forsake him well before the Lord would ever, ever forsake us. So we skip down to the 29th verse. In this verse here, the Lord, he tells us that he gives power to the weak and he, increase, he increases strength 
to those who have no might. Again, all we have to do is turn to him. Again, in this season where you may be struggling to find hope, to where you may be struggling to find the strength to push forward, God, he is giving you an invitation here right now to, to where he said, look, if you turn to me, I will empower you. I will lift you up. I will comfort you. Jesus, he invited all of those in the 11th chapter of Matthew's gospel in 28 verse. We see this invitation where Jesus, he said to all of us who are heavy laden, all we have to do is come to him. And what is it that Jesus said that he would give to us? Jesus said that he will give us rest. Again, there doesn't have to be war between us and the Lord. And the reason why there doesn't have to be war between us and the Lord, again, as we saw here in our lesson today, the glory of God was revealed through his only begotten son who came to this world, preached in this world. He lived in this world and he gave his life, reconciling all things in his blood to the Lord making harmony, making peace between man and God. We can have peace today. We can have peace of heart, we can have peace of mind, and I'm trying not to dig into my sermon now. But we can have it today. All we have to do is turn to God and enter into fellowship with Him. Will you do that today? I would hope that you would, because again, without the Lord, where would we be today? I don't know about you, but I know where I would be today. I would be lost in a world of darkness. I would be lost in the bondage of sin. I would be feeble. I would be weak. I would have absolutely no strength. But I stand in strength today. I stand in power today, not by my strength, not by my power, but by, again, the strength and the power of the Lord. So there in the 30th verse, we'll see where the Lord, he looked to the youth, those who we think will be strong who we think would be able to endure this world. And we'll see there where the Lord said, even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall fall without him. And so again, if the youth need the Lord, you better believe, believe us folks. I'm now approaching 40. I'm knocking on the door of 40 now. You better believe we need the Lord today. This world, it needs the Lord today. And so to find strength, we'll see there in one of the most well-known verses that we find in scripture. There in the 31st verse, the Lord said, in order for us to find strength, he said that we need to wait on him. We need to wait on the Lord. And the scripture, it says there that those who wait on the Lord shall do what? They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. What else shall they do? They shall walk and not faint. So to wait on the Lord means to, again, move by faith, to lean on the Lord, to trust in him, to not be trying to get out ahead of God. Again, we have to, we must, we should. We should trust in the Lord today, in this season, where again, some of us, we are struggling. Some of us, and get me, I, I, I totally understand where some of us, we are struggling to find the will and the hope to be able to push forward. But this season, to where we are now about to start celebrating Christmas and we should be celebrating the Christmas season, the giving of, of his only begotten son, to, through whom his glory is revealed to the world, we have hope. Don't ever let somebody tell you that you have too much hope. That's that's a red flag to me. There is no such thing as having too much hope. I'm, I'm a hope pastor. I'm a hope preacher. And I believe that you should always crave, live by that hope that you have. Because again, God, he that's the whole reason why he gave his only begotten son, so that we can have hope. That is why he ended our his warfare with us. That is why he chose to make harmony, make peace with us so that we can know that we can endure, so that we can know that we can make it in this world today. Not only do we have to put up with the mess of all of those that are living around us, but we have to put up with our own mess. We have to put up with living in a world of iniquity and in a world of sin. And let me tell you something, if you try to take on all of that by yourself, you will be crushed. There is no wonder 
why so many souls are beaten and shattered today because so many of us were trying to take on life by itself. And let me tell you, you'll never win that battle if you try to take on all of this by yourself. You need help, you need that strength, and you need that uplifting comfort. You need it from the Lord. And again, how do you do that today? Well, all you have to do is turn to Him, have faith in Him, trust in Him. And that is certainly something that I hope that you will do today. Okay. All right. So that is our Sunday school lesson this week. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson and I hope that you will share this lesson with somebody somewhere. And I hope that you'll come back for our Sunday school lesson next week, as we are going to be pushing forward here in this, this season of hope this Christmas season. So certainly come back for our Sunday school lesson next week. If you miss any Sunday school lessons, you should see a few links there on the screen. You can check out those Sunday school lessons. And again, if you aren't already following the New Found Faith channel, go ahead, make sure that you follow the channel today. Make sure that you like this week's lesson. Make sure that you share this week's lesson with somebody somewhere.